I'm Lauren. I invited my Lebanese friend, Dr. Nabil Jabor, to read to you passages from his book, Unshackled and Growing. Dr. Jabor is a distinguished professor with a doctorate in Islamic studies. A PDF version of the book in English is available to you for free on the website friendshippathways.com. You may also access past episodes there. I present to you the episode Before the Transformation. Apart from God, natural mankind has several characteristics. What are these? What do we exchange in the great transaction we make with Jesus? Number one, defilement and depravity. We see an example of defilement or uncleanliness in the Old Testament law describes a woman having her period. Anyone who touches her will be unclean till evening. Anything she lies on during her period will be unclean, and anything she sits on will be unclean. Whoever touches her bed must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be unclean till evening. This is Leviticus 15. A good Muslim friend of mine told me how sad he feels for his wife when she gets her monthly period during the month of Ramadan. She continues to fast like everyone else in the family. But deep in her heart, she knows that her fasting does not count because she is unclean. So when the month of Ramadan is over and everybody is celebrating with wonderful food and sweets, this woman is fasting alone to compensate for the days that didn't count. Jesus contrasted defilement, najasa, with inner cleanliness, tahara, like this. What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. The Gospel of Mark chapter 7. What is the difference between defilement and depravity? In our everyday language, we tend to think of defilement as being externally unclean. So when people practice the ceremonial washing, they become clean from external defilement. Depravity is a bigger issue and has to do with inner najasa or uncleanliness. Depravity cannot be taken care of by ceremonial washing. It takes far more than that. It requires a blood sacrifice, kafara. Consider this illustration. Suppose that on a hot day I exercise and come back home sweating and thirsty. My son wants to serve me by giving me a glass of water to drink. After receiving the glass of water, I see a very small piece of paper floating on the surface. It is easy for me to get rid of that little piece of paper and then drink the water. But suppose my son, before giving me the glass of water, places a few drops of black ink into the glass. Will I drink this filthy water? Of course not. Defilement is like that little piece of paper floating on the surface of the water. Depravity is like the ink drops that infiltrate the whole glass of water and make it filthy. When we come before the Almighty God, let's remember that the barrier separating us from Him is not our external defilement, but more important, our inner depravity. Secondly, shame, ar. Shame is central in the Arab world. In Jordan, up, up until late in the 20th century, if a man killed his sister because she had committed adultery, he was sentenced to only one year of imprisonment. 
If that Jordanian man murdered a person for other reasons, the punishment could be imprisonment for life. The message is that committing adultery brings shame to the family and it needs to be wiped out through the spilling of blood. Cleaning and wiping out shame is essential, not only in the Arab world, but also in other religions and cultures. Sin brings about not only guilt, but also shame. Sometimes the sense of shame is even stronger than the guilt. A student may experience some guilt if she cheats on a school exam. If she gets caught cheating, the sense of shame is even more painful. Humans are in a condition of shame when they stand before God. Adam, after his sin, hid and did not want to be in the presence of God. Yet before his sin, he enjoyed deep intimacy with God and looked forward to being in his presence. After he disobeyed God, he started avoiding God because of his shame. This is Genesis chapter 3. Cain, one of the sons of Adam, killed his brother Abel and lived with the consequences. He lived with shame and guilt and was described in the Bible as a restless wanderer hidden from the presence of God. Shame can eat away at you until it destroys your life. Thirdly, fear of the demonic and of dying. Earlier, I talked about how the devil is intent on destroying humans. The devil's weapons such as fear of demons and of being demon-possessed are terrifying. The dying process is also terrifying for every human who does not know what is on the other side. Can you imagine flying out of your local airport and not knowing where you were flying to? Can you imagine the dying process when a person is not sure whether he will be going to hell or to paradise? Fourthly, condemnation by God. We talked earlier about the book being opened on the day of judgment that contains a record of every sin a person has ever committed. This book is a witness against that person who stands guilty before God. I used an illustration showing that even the purest, most zealous person will have a huge book with a minimum of 60,000 sins to account for, no matter how well we think we are doing at climbing the impossible ladder. We are condemned by the holy God who has absolute standards. He will accept nothing less than a 100% passing grade. 